I'm Julian Assange. Roger, I'll get you into strength. Editor of WikiLeaks. We've exposed the world's secrets. These documents belong to the United States government. Being attacked by the powerful. The United States strongly condemns. I hey, quit asking questions. He broke the law. Illegally shoot the son of a... For 500 days now, I've been detained without charge. But that hasn't stopped us. I can't. Today, we're on a quest for revolutionary ideas that can change the world tomorrow. Welcome to a special episode of The World Tomorrow. Normally, I do this uh, from my location under house arrest, but today, because of the number of people involved in the Occupy movement, um, we've decided to do it here in the old Deutsche Bank uh, of London, which is controlled by friends of Occupy. We have Marissa Holmes from Occupy New York, Alexa O'Brien from Occupy New York and US Day of Rage, uh, Aaron Peters, uh, from Occupy London, Naomi Colvin uh, from Occupy London, and David Graeber from Occupy New York. So I want to sp split this program in really sort of two parts. Uh, the first part, so I want to understand how Occupy came to be, um, sort of people who are involved, the political background for uh, organising it um, and conducting its affairs and spreading it, um, and then look into where it's going to go. Uh, David, where, where do you think uh, this movement came that eventually uh, caused the occupation of Zuccotti Park and then spread out to the rest of the United States? Well, I think there's been sort of a global movement that, I mean, I guess it started in Tunisia and sort of swept across the Mediterranean, Greece, Spain. Um, so it's really the same movement that hit America. And there are a lot of people from Greece and Spain who were involved in the very early days and um, even before the occupation of Zuccotti Park and we were putting it together. So there, I, I think there's really a global ferment. Alexa, you, you were involved in this uh, US Day of Rage um, back, back in May 2010, but do, do you see that as, as, as the the time of, of, of it going into sort of um, the transition from cyberspace uh, to, to meat space, or, or is there some earlier analog? Uh, I, I think definitely. I mean, I, I look at Opbart and, uh, and other smaller uh, swarm activist activities. Social media and the uh, transformation in the organization of media also has played a role in the last year. Um, uh, in Occupy Wall Street. It's clearly that clearly there was a feeling emerging from the Arab Spring. Um, I mean, this is this is very rarely alluded to. 2008, Egypt gets the World Bank's number one kind of reforming country in the developing mm -hmm. world. Um, and in terms of neoliberal reforms, Egypt was unbeatable in, in, in North Africa and the Middle East from the World Bank and the IMF's point of view. The, the, bigger, the bigger kind of phenomenon that's going on here is that after the Second World War, the nation state is broadly seen as kind of repository of democratic accountability. Mm. Now, since the late 1970s, that's been going away. Right. And in some places, it's never existed, right? But that's now a global phenomenon. We now recognise that mm. public policy outcomes aren't happening at the national level and that policy makers aren't actually the ones who are in national parliaments, they're elsewhere, and the ones who are dictating policy aren't in any way accountable or, you know, they're not democratic representatives. And that's a global phenomenon, and that's in... Right. That's in India, that's in China, that's in the US, that's in the UK. We don't, even ju we don't just have a global financial crisis, we have a global political crisis yeah. because our institutions mm -hmm. no longer function. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of the points of the global justice movement, which is there are these sort of newly created administrative global planetary political mechanisms. Like the WTO. Have, like the WTO, mm -hmm. like the IMF. The people, at least in places like the US, weren't even supposed to know exist. Um, but we're in fact governing the world. I mean, it's the first really effective planetary bureaucracy, which was created in the name of this sort of free market ideology, which is supposed to stand against it, uh, bureaucracy, but in fact did exactly the opposite. Thus, the revolt is always in the name of democracy, because that's the thing which is obviously lacking. The financial crisis just brought it home, um, especially in the matter of debt, I think, where you know, it became very clear that the debts of the big players could be completely renegotiated by these, or through these global mechanisms, but yours can't because your politicians are beholden to them and not to you. So I want to get right, right down into the, sort of the practical genesis. So this is sort of a broad things happening in the background. But it, if we go back to, um, to this 
some of the, the, the key sort of ingredients in, in Occupy New York. In, in our research, we see these like, ah, we got the eight, got the 99%, but actually the phrasing wasn't, we are the 99%, wasn't just quite right. That was and, and then, actually... And then, and then there was, you know, th these little sort of groping forwards uh, in presentation uh, skills that, that eventually coalesced into something. It's a beautiful example of a collective process. I think I threw out, like, why don't we do something of 99%, and someone else, I think some Spaniards said, we the 99%, and then um, I believe Chris uh, set up this Tumblr page, well, he put in the R. <laughs> so it was actually different people contributed each word, but it, it just came together beautifully. Yeah. Naomi, have you seen that sort of that, I that iterative process? Something has erected, it wasn't born as a burst of inspiration in just one person's brain. It seems to have been something that actually has evolved through all these processes. I think that's right. I think there are identifiable different streams which feed in to Occupy. And Occupy is almost a galvanising moment when people who are doing actually quite different things realise they can cooperate together and create something that's really extraordinary. If you want to look at Occupy London specifically, the trigger is clearly the example from Occupy Wall Street, the idea that um, this extraordinary thing, thing can happen in the, on the other side of the Atlantic in somewhere you would have never expected it to be possible and so forth, therefore you have to do something in London. Um, but you also have feeding into that what's happened elsewhere in Europe over the past year. What happens in London is not possible without um, the example of what happened in Spain. It's really a moment when everything comes together. How, how much did the Indignatus movement in Spain practically feed in, in in terms of logistical support or bodies on the ground uh, for Occupy New York? Well, there were many members of the Indignados that were actually in New York for one reason or another leading up to September 17th, and they came to the early General Assemblies and you know, gave us the, the foundation and, and the context for what we were doing. So we learned a great deal from them. There were even Egyptians there. I mean, we, we got emails from Egypt saying, I'm going to New York specifically to be there for this particular action. So I think also in terms of the iterative learning process, I can say for myself personally that watching what was going on in Europe about how you scale that out, that information out for occupations um, was definitely directly taken from that particular movement. No, Naomi, in uh, Occupy London, there was a, a street sign put up, um, Tahrir, Tahrir Square, in front of the St Paul's yeah. Church. One, one, of the mo one of the most photographed signs. I've no idea who put it up, but... Um, yeah, um, I would say that there was clearly people identified what they, what they were doing quite strongly with the inspiration of the Arab Spring. In terms of practical bodies on, on the ground, it's the European movement which feeds in much more to London, just because where we are. I'm interested in this because I'm interested in a particular branch of, of philosophy about technique and the domination of technique. That if, regard, whatever we try and do politically in one direction or another, we have to do it efficiently if it is to win. And to do it efficiently, we have to adopt efficient techniques. And so everyone, regardless of which direction that they're going in, starts to adopt efficient techniques. And in the end, it's the techniques, um, the techniques that win. But David? Uh, I think part of those techniques, though, is not just the um, social media, but uh, there has been a tradition, for at least since the 70s, of creating new forms of direct democracy, of facilitation, consensus, of decentralization, of decision making. That is, is deeply practical, and in a way, is there's a kind of a synthesis whereby it defines itself against the way you act on social media. It's a kind of synergy. So on the one hand, you're spreading information of certain kinds through social media, but at the same time, there's these deeply personalized new forms of democracy, and that tradition was. The fact that we had that to draw on, that there's people who know how to do facilitation and institutions like the People's Microphone, which had been developed over years, that are there to draw on was absolutely critical. This, this methodological culture that visually we're very familiar with from Occupy, the, hu the human microphone, um, this mic check, um, sort of it, it's a bit of, bit of street theatre on the other hand, it seems to be uh, practical, the uh, General Assembly, this hand-waving stuff, mm -hmm. which to me when I, when I first saw I thought seemed terribly sort of effete and, and in, in, ineffectual. <laughs> but I, 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 I can see it if you've got a whole lot of people <laughs> and you want to be able to hear someone, maybe it's, it's, not, it's not a bad, a bad outcome. Uh, Aaron, do, have, you, have you studied how these techniques uh, came to be? Were, were, were there, in fact, any innovations in terms of technique? Uh, so if you're going back to that notion of the meme and memetics, now there's an argument that's always existed in terms of how humans uh, 
share identities, how they create new ones, how they internalise them. But the point with these new kinds of communicating means that that process is rapidly speeded up. I think there's genuinely a relationship between, especially among younger people, online practice and offline practice, where they're not uh, interested in leaders, they're not interested necessarily in profit models. They're interested in the creation of value, but frequently it's the creation of value beyond the profit motive and beyond being coerced to do something. So it's kind of volunt voluntary, um, voluntary collective action. No, no, I mean the, the techniques used in, in Occupy London, were they grabbed from seeing what were people were doing in, York, in Occupy New York, or, or is it older? I think there is an interesting tension between the way consensus works online, which it does if you look at how you sort of how the hive mind situation works. It's it's consensus, but in a much less structured form. And there is an interesting tension between that, which is a sort of mindset a lot of people came to occupy with, with the way um, this tradition, this more traditional, if I can call it, consensus, this structured consensus decision making works, work, works on the ground. And that's attention which I think we explored at Occupy London without fully fully resolving it. We can see why Occupy didn't ha wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. We had these protest movements wh whirling up at Se Seattle mm -hmm. and Genoa and so on and bang mm -hmm. we had September 11 and that was the end of it. Um, so we can see why it wouldn't have happened 10 years ago but why didn't it happen five years ago? I think well primarily social movements are around they're always born out of grievance and a, and a, and a sense of being aggrieved. Um, and I think these are simply, what's happening is simply impossible without the global financial crisis. And then it genuinely could have been the end of capitalism as we know it. We would have had massive problems with distributing food. The problem with complex societies is that when something goes wrong, it goes very wrong. So you think it, it wouldn't have happened if impossible. it wasn't for the, for the GFC? That was, a, that was such a, a driver. Well, because there are, tele, there, there, are tent, there are tent cities in the States that aren't within the Occupy movement. They're people who are simply homeless. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a political symptom as much as agency. D David, um, Occupy uh, sort of simmered for a while, for the first, the first week or, or ten days or something, until there was violence. Mm. Well, yes, I mean... One so, I mean, it was in police <laughs> violence, but nonetheless violence. And violence is sort of what? It was a, um, an effective marketing <laughs> mechanism. Yeah, we, we didn't Hollywood movies are full of violence. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I was there and, like, you know, living in the park for the first week, and so I can attest to the fact that we didn't simmer. Um, we, <laughs> we protested all day, all week, you know, we, we occupied Wall Street. We went in, you know, at the opening bell and the closing bell every day. Um, we held two general assemblies a day. We were, you know, putting, none, none, starting to put up tents. The, the media reportage just wasn't there, and it really kicked in once there was violence. I mean, I, I suppose, but our aim was never to, you know, I'm just suggest I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that maybe it should be based upon the, the experience of this event. Well, uh, that may, it, maybe actually the provoking police violence is is something that really should be done. Well, you if don't you really want have to provoke, provoke it. it. It's going to happen. <laughs> I just want to be clear that we, we did not provoke, provoke police violence. We we took a Making direct. Making sure you can record police violence. <laughs> we we took a non-violent direct action. We went and we occupied a square so that we could have a general assembly and start to talk about the world that we wanted to live in, which we saw as completely antithetical to the world we we're currently living in and the structures that governed it. So, yeah, I mean, I guess by being there and by exercising a directly democratic process, we were posing a threat and so the police had to respond. Well, I mean, there's nothing that terrifies the American government so much as the threat of democracy breaking out in America. <laughs> um, they're, they're sure to react violently to that. The, the, the day that Occupy Sex started, I was outside the main kind of cordon of police, right? And I think I counted about 20 vans. And I mean, I've seen this enough times now. I heard the dogs coming out. I've seen the Ford intelligence teams. They've got their cameras now. OK, and this is now where they beat the living daylights out of everybody. <laughs> uh, and there's no media here. And they know that if they don't stop it today, this could very quickly gain traction. No, no I mean, you, you were the coordinator for Bradley Manning campaign. And there's actually a rather interesting and unusual connection between the number of people who are some, in some ways bound up with supporting WikiLeaks or Bradley Manning um, or, or Anonymous uh, and, and the Occupy movement. But Bradley Manning was made an example of. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't just arrested and then everything was kept quiet. I mean, he was made a prominent example to act as a disincentive um, because authority needs uh, to give prominent examples of what happens to people who are alleged to ha have disobeyed authority in order to keep authority. Um, these TV scenes of 
protesters um, on the receiving end of violence in the weak position in relation, relation to violence. Um, do, do you think that that is also, over the longer term, setting an example, a negative example? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things in there. I think the first is that what was happening to Bradley at Quantico, um, it was being very badly treated over there, as you know, the UN Special Rapporteur has come out and finally said. In terms of media representations of conflict, I think it's, you know, without doubt that the coverage of, you know, what happened in the early days of New York, those, those were the those were the pictures that went around the globe. They weren't, it wasn't mainstream media they came from, it was citizen media, it was live stream. Yeah. So, and I think there's a, certainly a degree to the, the presence of media and the fact that something is happening in full view of the world, which is a really important thing that's happened with, with Occupy, being, you know, documenting itself all the time, is kind of an important inhibiting force. I mean, if it wasn't for live stream and it wasn't for our own social media teams, then we wouldn't have gotten into the mainstream press. We pushed the dialogue um, mm. in a really important way. Um, Alexa, talk to me about the, the rule of law and, and Occupy. Well, it was one of the, the demands of the US Day of Rage, um, seems to be rule of law, due process, Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, at the base of any kind of, uh, in the case of the United States, a, you know, democratic republic, or at least it's said to be a democratic republic, there are s several institutions. There's the civic square, there's the press, and there's elections. And when those things are in the hands of people, the institutions sort of find their health, you know, because they check each other. I think um, in terms of the rule of law, I mean, my own experience, uh, just if, if one citizen, one dollar, one vote, so to, is so radical that it's got me written up in Australian security mag, you know, a tied to Al-Qaeda, and I'm getting private messages from other security contractors that have relationships with the FBI telling me that, you know, be careful, you're, you're, you're somehow connected to Al-Qaeda. That tells me immediately... <laughs> um, it's an intimidation tactic, you know, essentially. D David, mm -hmm. Occupy, with that word, came to world prominence as a result of Occupy New York. Uh, but it, it spread over the United States as well. Can, can you describe a bit this spread uh, of Occupy over the continental United States? It was remarkably quick. Um, I, I was flabbergasted. I was astounded. Um, because, you know, you dream of these things happening, but you never really think they're actually going to happen. Um, <laughs> it, I would say in three weeks, we had something like 800 occupations. And you know, granted, some of those occupations were just like one guy with a sign, but a lot of them weren't. <laughs> um, a lot of them were, were large camps of people in places like you know, Missoula, uh, Occupy, Saskatchewan, and Canada. I mean, it all, uh, it was a remarkable outpouring, uh, and it happened very, very quickly. I want to get on to, to, to space. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to occupy a space at all? Um, like why, why, not, why not just stay at home? You've got your Rolodex, you've got your friends, you've got your social networking. Uh, why not just coordinate? from behind the scenes? Isn't a bit of a waste of time to pitch up a tent and you can't do things efficiently? Um, well, it, it's, it goes back to the question about why online movements move, move offline at all. I think there is a natural human need to communicate face to face. And actually, it is much more profound. I think working online, you're sort of, it's about coordinating autonomous individuals to do things. And you have some feeling that you're part of a community of people that feels the same thing or is concerned about the same thing. But it's nothing like, be, you know, being in a space that say, stop, you know, every, everyone is there and willing to, you know, and wanting to talk to each other. So it's actually recreating the kind of society which people ex wish existed all the time. I think it's also an experiment of, to see how far you can push uh, your engagement with, you know, in the civic space. Meaning, you know, when civic space is the curb between the Chuck E. Cheese and the Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, which, which it is in the United States in a lot of cases, in a lot of even <coughs> small towns, there is a, a need to create a publicness that is not private, uh, that is uh, not related to uh, one's job even, that is, is, is the we, the we that comes together that deals with Carlisle buying our water or whatever it might be. So, David, does the, does the space have to be contested? I mean, everyone could go out uh, in, into, the, into the redwoods of California or something. Um, <laughs> oh. uh, and, and in, and in, in fact, um, the G8 has been moved off to Camp David, uh, it seems, Indeed. In, in order to achieve just that effect. Well, I think, yes. Um, I mean, I think there's been 
For the last 30 years, there's been the systematic assault on, on the notion of community and, and, and the idea of the imagination, or political imagination. And this is a way of reclaiming both at the same time. So I think that that idea of taking something back is critically important. Is it, is it, is it a, a demonstration of sovereignty in literal terms of, of an area of land? We physically control through our political decision making absolutely. this space, you do not physically control. It. Absolutely, and that's what's critical about it. I mean, it's it's a dual power strategy. I mean, we are talking about force. Um, we're not talking about legalities. They're not talking about legalities and neither are we. My, either might deploy one as a weapon. Um, but what we're saying is this is our space. This is our, we're the public. This is a public space. Um, we're going to take it. Uh, and that simple act of defiance is enormously creative. I mean, everything follows from that. And everything else we've done has been from you know, the fact that we start out without accepting the terms of the existing order and with the will to imagine a new one. <clears throat> in, the, in the domination of that physical space, in creating your own little mini state uh, at Occupy, which is I think the correct term when you physically control an, er an area of land, when you have the monopoly on coercive force. Um, you, you started to erect certain structures about how to, how to deal with each other uh, mm -hmm. and how to coordinate with each other and certain methodologies for dealing with the police, for, for, for dealing with opportunists within the Occupy movement, for dealing with crazy people, for dealing with the garbage. Um, those methodologies that you came up with for political decision making and, and practically dealing with things, do you see them as a blueprint for dealing with wider society or are they methodologies that are simply for or mostly for um, dealing with the particular problem at hand, which is how to occupy a square. Yeah, um, I, I don't think we ever did have the monopoly of force within Occupy. Mm -hmm. It would have been a lot Classified. easier had we, you know, <laughs> had, 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 had we done that. And actually negotiating mm -hmm. what, you know, what you do in this situation where um, sort of, you know, any, any disruption that may happen, actually you don't, actually you don't have the power of coercion. You have the power, you have the power of persuasion. You have the power of showing what, you know, what the majority of people in that in that space think, but also, but ultimately, no, you don't have coercion, and that also is, you know, is an education. So you've got you've course. got a disruptive person in there, yeah. or they're a mad person. They're they're, go, they're ruining it for everyone. Um, what do you do with them? What do you do with them in Occupy? How right, how do you question. get rid of them? Um, we, um, do you call the cops? What do you do? We don't do that. Do no, we? actually, we've been we've been using a combination of things: um, de-escalation, mediation, and nonviolent communication have been the the modes of dealing with uh, conflicts within the park. So David, if you push comes to shove at, at, at the end, I stay there. Your fucking rules don't apply to me. <laughs> I want to drum when I want to drum. I want to talk when I want to talk. I want to be naked when I want to be naked. <laughs> That you, don't you need your big guys to turn up at some stage and go, look, buddy, come on, you know, you're ruining it for everyone, piss off. There are many ways to put pressure on people. So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> with Such the, as? So, with the, the drummers, for instance, I mean, we, we had an assembly where we talked about the, the drumming situation. We negotiated it within the realm of the assembly. Alexa. There certainly are conflicts and tensions that are natural to human beings in groups within Occupy. It's not like the, the space that Occupy creates suddenly is like a utopia, because it isn't. Uh, Aaron, at, at the end, don't you need a mechanism, a process to deploy coercive force? Uh, it's um, practically, it's a question that needs answering, of course. Um, but. Um, God, you guys are so uncomfortable with this. I, I think, no, I have I, 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 I the privilege of going to a decent union. This is, this, is a, this is a general kind of existential question well, about Well, you might put them in psychotherapy for I, 10 years. I don't incline right, to that well, person. You know. put them in psychotherapy uh, for 10 I, I mean, years, but in the meantime, you've got someone <laughs> in your goddamn camp banned, causing a problem. There have been people who've been banned from meetings and things like that. That's happened. Um, but, yeah. can, I mean... Uh, in a way, we're, 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 we're trying to delicately move around some issues that perhaps we don't want to talk about so much, which is intentional subversion. Uh, there were attempts to sort of dump people on us. Uh, um, there were 
you know, at so, some point the police were taking pr recently released prisoners and taking them in buses to the park and saying, hey, there's free food here. Um, <laughs> so it isn't just that the socio sociopathy just naturally appears if you have people in a camp. There was a very directed attempt to try to subvert us We're, and give us the choice between, you know, either being overwhelmed or kind of turning into a social welfare model where we take care of these people, which is another thing that started happening. How did Occupy London uh, prevent pathological social grifters uh, who, who are very uh, glib in, the, in their words, uh, good at telling one thing to one person, another thing to another person, spreading rumours, sowing dissent uh, from rising up to the top. Or has it? Well... <laughs> um... Right. If it has a top, it's very easy to do. But if yeah. it's a horizontal movement, it's really quite hard. I mean, there's only so much damage a sociopath can do. I mean, so what I always say about anarchism, when people say, well, what about, <laughs> well, what about, you know, people who are just don't care about anyone else and are selfish jerks? And I'll say, well, yes, but at least they won't end up in charge of armies, uh, which they do <laughs> here, you know. Um, there's really only so much damage, like... Uh, such a person can do if they don't have a structure where they can start dominating and rising to the top. One thing I actually agree with William F. Buckley, he once said that I'd, I'd rather be governed by the first 300 names in the phone book than the people currently <laughs> running <laughs> Congress. I agree. <laughs> They'd probably do a better job. Um, I mean, in the end, what, what, however we govern ourselves, uh, we have to be able to be competitive with those who would seek to govern us another way. Absolutely. This is why an international movement is so important, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, there's a feeling out there that the enemy has become increasingly globalized, and the only way it can be challenged is by global movement. So in, in that sense, the, whether states are competitive with one another is becoming increasingly relevant. Aaron? So we've got the biggest transformation in the global political economy in terms of stuff going in South, Southeast Asia. With all this debt, I mean, it's only going to end one way. Like, clearly the West is over. Like, it's just, it's apparent to everybody but public policymakers in the West. <laughs> it's, it's just it's abundantly evident. I don't think it's ridiculous. clear they don't really know, too. Well, They're I know. When you start talking about 1989 <laughs> moments and money not coming out of cash points, people laugh at you. go, like, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the party's over. It only makes sense that the 1% is going to try to grab all the cookies if there's less cookies to grab. Um, but... It seems very unlikely, if you look at it historically, that they're going to end up with them. <laughs>